Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Nerdopolitan. Today we have as a guest, Elle Flores, and she's going to introduce herself to you guys. Hello, my name is Elle Flores, and I work at Wall Street Realty, located in Inglewood, California. I started in real estate back in 2009 when I first got my license, and I've been working with Wall Street Realty for the past year and a half. Uh, I like working with Anna Moore. She's actually the broker there. Uh, she has a very big heart. And one of the things I really love about her is her compassion for where people are right now with their home situation and the pandemic that we're all experiencing. So um, I like to help people understand the real estate process. I like to help them understand uh, home ownership and preparing for home ownership. Great, amazing. We have a Great show, so let's get going. With all, everything that's going on in, in the world, people are facing tough times with COVID-19. And in California, some people are facing foreclosure and eviction. So today we're going to talk about some strategies to avoid uh, these things. We're going to talk about foreclosure, moratoriums, COVID relief proposals, eviction bans, keeping equity facing foreclosure, federally backed mortgages, and how to avoid uh, eviction in general. So, El, welcome. Thank you, Antonio. It's good to be here. Thank you for coming again. Thank you. And uh, what, what strategies are available for people that are facing foreclosure or, 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 or eviction? Uh, there's many strategies that can be used. Um, one is the most common, which is a modification. Basically, what uh, entails in that is the homeowner would contact their lender or their bank and explain the hardship that they're facing with regards to not being able to make the monthly mortgage payment or maybe uh, being able to make a lesser amount of a monthly mortgage payment and not able to make the full amount of the payment. So that's one strategy, the modification. Another strategy would be a refinance. Of course, with a refinance, with uh, any type of refinance, you'd have to demonstrate your ability to pay. Uh, but let's say in the, in the case of a homeowner that lost their job during the pandemic, but now has a job now uh, and uh, can now refinance. So they can now demonstrate their ability to pay. So that would be a second uh, strategy. A third strategy would be, again, based on qualification, the homeowner must be of 62 years of age or older, and they must have at least 65% equity in their home. And at that point, they would qualify for a reverse mortgage. Uh, then there is, of course, a forbearance. A forbearance would mean that you'd have to contact your lender or your bank and at the discretion of the lender decide on whether they're going to be willing to accept a lower monthly payment, kind of similar to a modification. And the difference is that uh, they can take a lower monthly mortgage payment or they can halt making the payments temporarily where that would not be the case in a modification. So that's how a forbearance and a modification differ. Uh, so those would be the strategies. And again, depending on what they qualify for, the most, the one that of course, you don't have to qualify for is selling your home. And that would be the most advantageous for someone who is facing a hardship and is continuing to have a hardship and doesn't really see anything in the near future with a job to be able to make monthly mortgage payments. And so they should consider foreclosing, I mean, selling the house before foreclosure. Reason why you wanna do that is because you're now preventing a black mark on your FICO score rating. And um, if you have equity, especially if you have equity in the house, if you let the bank sell or take your house away from you, you're losing the equity. Let's say you have $150,000 worth of equity. That equity could help you start all over again somewhere else, have a brand new beginning, and you'll be avoiding the black mark on your FICO score. Uh, so there's also a short sale. A short sale means that um, you're, the bank's not going to want to take too long to allow you to sell the house. What does that mean? That means that the homeowner has to be willing to sell their home 
less than what the market dictates. So let's say the market dictates that you can sell your house. Your house is worth, uh, let's just say $500,000. But because the bank wants you to hurry up and sell it, you're going to have to offer the price of the house to the public at a much lower amount. That would be called a short sale. That's still going to impact you negatively on your FICO score, but not as bad as a foreclosure. But those are the strategies. Okay, great. Well, that's a... Um... That's a, a great um, response. We really got a, a feel of what we're going to talk about today. Right. But some of the people that are listening or are watching this video, they're not aware with all the terms that you already know. <laughs> right. So, for example, I don't, I don't have any idea of what you just said. Okay. Let's say, let's say, uh, let's start from the from the from the beginning. What is foreclosure? <laughs> okay, so foreclosure is a legal process in which the bank or the lender, depending on who you have your mortgage with, can legally take your house away because you are no longer paying your monthly mortgage payment. So what people tend to forget, or maybe they don't understand the contract at signing when you're purchasing the house, the contract does say when you're applying for the loan to purchase the house, is that the house that you are purchasing, that home that you're going to be living in, that's gonna be used as collateral for the loan that you're borrowing to purchase the house. Because obviously you don't have $500,000 to put in the house, you don't have the full cash, so you're gonna finance the house. Well, in that contract, it states that if you are no longer able to make those monthly mortgage payments for whatever reason, you lost your job, you're in the hospital, you were in a bad accident or a disease struck you, anything, and you are no longer able to make your obligation in paying those monthly mortgage payments, you're literally signing your name on the contract saying that the bank, I'm allowing the bank or the lender to take my house away because I can no longer make these payments. And that's what I've noticed in dealing with people, homeowners that are going through foreclosure. They don't understand why they're going through foreclosure. They think the bank should understand they're going through a hardship and allow them to stay in their homes until they're able to pay again or at least a lower monthly mortgage payment. So that's where the term modification comes into play or forbearance. Those are usually the two first strategies that homeowners will attempt to get some help with the lender or the mortgage uh, or the, the lender. So I hope I answered your question with regards to what is a foreclosure. It is a legal process in which the bank or the lender can take your home away based on the contract you signed. So this is like an eviction? Is that like an eviction? They, you know, they take away your home, so you have to, you're kicked out on the street? No, eviction applies to people who rent. Uh, foreclosure are for those who own a home and can no longer pay their home. So eviction are strictly, they're two different uh, uh, strategies for two different uh, uh, people. Foreclosures for homeowners people. and eviction is for renters. Correct. That is correct. Okay. So uh, we'll, go, we'll get into um, what strategies we can use for renters okay. later. Let's stick with the homeowners for now. Um, so you mentioned something about mortgage forbearance. What does it mean when they mention mortgage is in forbearance? Okay, so the forbearance is similar to a modification. The differences are that the lender or the banker can allow you not to make payments at all for a certain period of time. Whereas so. a modification, the lender or the banker is allowing you to make lower monthly mortgage payments but they're not allowing that you stop or cease making payments where that is a definition of a forbearance in that the lender, again, upon the discretion of the lender or the bank, they can decide to say, okay, because of your hardship, Mr. Homeowner, we will allow a lower monthly mortgage payment or because of your hardship, Mr. Owner, then we will um, not expect any monthly mortgage payments from you for a period of, let's say, three months or six months, or nine months, depending on the discretion of the lender. 
So this forbearance is taking place now or for everyone or what, not, what's happening now with... Not for everyone, not for it, everyone. And that's that's a case-by-case -case basis, again, upon the discretion of the lender. Okay. What does that mean? That means they're not obligated, they're not mandated. Oh, Lenders okay. are not mandated to work with you if you can no longer continue to make your monthly mortgage payments as was agreed upon at the time of signing when you signed for your loan. So the forbearance is something that a lender or a bank would, out of the goodness of their heart, kind of, sort of speaking. Out of the kindness of their heart, if they feel <laughs> sorry for you. If they feel sorry for okay, you, we'll they want to work with you. stop everything in forbearance, but I don't think banks work like that. That's not what they normally do. But, but again, that's not to say that they never do it. And that's why it's a good idea for homeowners who find themselves in hardships to call their lender, call their bank, and ask Maybe Can, it's, maybe it's the if it's the bank owner's mom, then they'll do a forbearance. <laughs> Some kind of a family member, maybe they'll do yeah. <laughs> a, a a favor. But no, there are forbearances. There there are, and again, it, it's up to the discretion of the lender. Okay, um, I read somewhere about the there's some moratoriums uh, regarding the. The COVID-19? Yes. So I don't even know what moratorium is. What is that? Okay, so a moratorium, what the, the definition of a moratorium is yeah. that uh, the powers that be, you know, the, the local states uh, or the city has decided that banks and lenders cannot foreclose on homeowners that are finding themselves in a hardship and cannot pay the monthly mortgage payment. So it's, it's a halt. It's a stop. It's a cease that they are mandated not to foreclose, even if a homeowner cannot pay their monthly mortgage payment. That's what a moratorium is. Okay. And right now we are in a moratorium. Okay. So the governor or the president are ordering moratoriums to keep people in their homes. That is And correct. that is a good thing. That's a good thing because as a result of people not being able to pay their mortgages, and if the moratorium was not in place, there would be a lot hire homeless people in the streets. And with COVID amongst us, that would not be a very good idea. That would not be very smart of our of our governors and our states and cities to allow to happen in the in in the midst of a pandemic, in my opinion. Yeah, I think everybody agrees with that. Especially if you've got children. And right now we're we're in the winter, middle of winter, so that would not be a good idea to have people kicked out of their home. Yeah. So who is protected by the moratorium? Is that for everyone? Or is that just like a case-by-case -case basis, like in the case, like uh, with what, what occurs with forbearance? Unfortunately, it does not apply to every homeowner. The moratoriums are extended to um, government-sponsored loans or government-backed loans. So what's the difference? Okay, so a government-backed loan or sponsored loan, let's talk about the sponsored loans first, are your uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. They are sponsored by the government to offer loans to the public. Sorry, so, can you repeat that? Freddie Mac? Yeah, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. These are two different um, institutions okay. that provide loans for homeowners, mm -hmm. and they are sponsored by the government. So they get special, um, um, like, Low, you can you can provide a lower monthly uh, down payment or rather down payment when purchasing the house. So they offer certain types of incentives uh, for uh, certain homes in certain areas uh, for uh, a government sponsored loan. So uh, and then so another type would be uh, the government backed loans and government backed loans are your FHA, your VA and U USDA. So these are loans that are literally backed by the government. Well, what does that mean, that it's backed by the government? That means that the government guarantees that the lender is not going to be losing out on any money should the homeowner not be able to continue making their payments. So those are the ones that are under a moratorium. The ones that are not under a moratorium are your conventional loans loans that are not backed up by the government, that are not sponsored by the government, these are not under a moratorium. These are the people that are indeed facing foreclosure. 
so if there's a lender that's a private company, they're not covered by the moratorium? They're not covered by the moratorium. So as I, we, we, I had discussed earlier, it's under the discretion of the lenders to decide to want to work with the homeowner who's going through a hardship through the form of a forbearance or a modification or a short sale or just sell the house. Okay, so th those are the only possibilities left if you for, have... For conventional loans that are not backed... By the government. By the government. Okay. Um, okay, so so as we advance, let's talk about now with the um, eviction because that also has a, a moratorium. Yes, so again, moratoriums are apply for um, owners that have uh, government-backed loans or sponsor, government-sponsored loans, right? Yeah. So let's say there's a, uh, uh, a person who is no longer able to pay their rent. They, uh, again, the moratorium protects the renters because of not, able to, not being able to pay their, monthly, their, their rent payment. So that, that befalls under the category of evictions. Evictions are for those who rent, and th they are protected under the moratorium. Uh, again, not all of them, because again, it depends on the kind of loan that the person who owns the place you're living in. So those are the ones, uh, 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 so it's, it's kind of scary. The, the, those who don't have a, a government-backed loan or a sponsored loan, those are the ones that are not a lot that are, that are not covered by the moratorium and so those are the ones that are facing eviction so is there any possibility for renters that are backed up with the rent to halt there an are eviction? there are programs out there especially now in we are we have a new administration now so the new administration is rolling out or uh, coming up with uh, strategies to help people who cannot pay their rent and and we're talking about not just people whose uh, d dwellings that they live in are backed uh, as a government back loan or sponsored back loan. Regardless, regardless, there are programs being made available to those people, but they would have to inquire. They would have to go on the internet and find out what is available for for uh, people to pay their rent or help, you know, rent help. They need to 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 actually search that out and find out. Well, who can I go to for help? And there are they are coming up with those kind of things. Okay. You must qualify again. Certain um, income uh, has a lot to do with it. So if you make, uh, I think it's under a hundred thousand dollars a year, you would qualify for uh, back rent and utilities being paid. Okay. And that's under a, a, a I think a bill under Governor Newsom. Uh, that there's 25... Yeah, let me read this uh, information here. Yes. So in California, um, Governor Gavin Newsom hopes to extend the state's eviction moratorium beyond March 31st to June 30th with a vote scheduled... So, so I already passed. It was Thursday, January 28th. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to see what happened with that uh, to extend the, the state's eviction moratorium beyond 30, the 30, 31st to the June 30th. Yes. Well, what we know so far is that, yeah, it's been extended to March. We okay. know that. So from, from January 31st, it was extended to March. We now know that. But they're trying to see if they can extend it beyond March to June. That's the part that they're working on. So what should Californians that are facing eviction or foreclosure do in these time frames? Like, what can they do now okay. from the... From now to the 31st of March, okay. what should they do be doing? So at least for now, ho homeowners can feel a little bit of relief, a little bit of a respite as a result of knowing that they're not going to be foreclosed on because of the moratorium, again, for government-backed loans. These people have some time. They have some time to think about what options they should exercise and not wait to the last minute to get foreclosed on. So the options again, call your lender, find out, find, find out, do you qualify for a forbearance? Do you qualify for a modification? In those situations where you do not qualify, again, don't wait to the last minute, 
uh, if you don't want your credit to be ruined any further because a foreclosure on your uh, credit report is not look favorable at all, that inhibits you from being a homeowner for seven years. In other words, that will be on your record for seven years. So if you want to get back on your feet and get be a homeowner again, you're not going to be able to do it because no bank's going to want to give you a loan if you've been foreclosed on. Same thing like for a person who rents and was evicted and uh, now they're having to find another place to live, but now they have an eviction on their record. Landlords aren't going to want to rent to a person that has a history of having an eviction. Same thing with foreclosure. Uh, lenders, banks will consider it a high risk. And I'm not saying that they're, they wouldn't lend to someone that has a foreclosure on their record, but it would take at least three to four years before a bank may consider someone who has a foreclosure on their record to uh, lend them again. And even if they decided, again, under the discretion of the lenders to allow this person a loan for a purchase of a, ho of a home, uh, they're going to be paying higher interest rates. They're going to have uh, more expensive down payments than someone who didn't have a foreclosure on their history. So basically what you're saying is that people shouldn't stay at home and be nihilistic or existentialist and say, oh, okay, I'm going to get foreclosure. So I'll just stay here and sleep on the couch. They should <laughs> go and talk to the lender. Or for example, can they talk to you, call you and say, hey, I need help. I don't know much about all this that's going yes. on. They can definitely call me and they can call me at 800-741-2838. My name is L. Flores. I work at Wall Street Realty located in Inglewood, California. So yes, 818-741-2838. I can answer your questions. I can even help you with a strategy. So we'll put that information under the video and you can also copy it there. Um, if, you, if you're not sure about what we're talking about, uh, Elle will kindly explain with lots of patience. Definitely. Like the, the, the patience she's had with me. Indeed. Great. So let, let's continue with the... Um, you mentioned federally backed loans. That's those are the ones that are on moratorium that the government's authorizing those, moratorium. Yeah, that's correct. How can how can I get a federally federally backed loan? That sounds much better than a conventional going, loan, than, right? Than a private loan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a catch. There's a catch to everything. There's okay. no such thing as a free lunch. Okay. okay. So yes, while there are um, special treatment right now for people in the pandemic, uh, having a little bit of air to breathe, not realizing, and thank God, they're not going to be foreclosed upon because of the moratorium. That's a great thing if you have a mortgage-backed loan. So the differences between a mortgage, uh, a government-backed loan versus a um, conventional loan is that your uh, government-backed loans tend to be a little bit more expensive. You are paying a higher interest rate than you would if you were going through a conventional loan. Um, and they, they, they do offer certain, certain perks for the homeowner in terms of a lower down payment. Again, driven by your FICO score. For example, um, you, you'd be um, having to pay a 10% down payment if your FICO scores fall below 500. If they're at 530 or higher, then you're looking at maybe paying 3% on a down payment for a, a government-backed loan. And how long does that process usually take? Is it faster than going to it's the same. a private? It's, it's, the a, same? it's the same as far as the, the time uh, frame concerned is the same. Okay. So that could be also an interesting idea for people that are wanting to buy something right right well uh what i like to tell people who rent is, is there's there's got to be certain things that they've got lined up if they're right now rents are very expensive it's very expensive to rent and if you can afford a house if you can afford the down payment of a house and you you can face the commitment of a 30-year term uh paying back that loan uh, and making that monthly mortgage payment, your monthly mortgage payment could be less 
than paying rent, including the taxes and the insurance. So that's something that renters really need to look at. Uh, and again, it depends on how good their credit is. Of course, we all know that loans, credit uh, given or extended is dependent on our FICO history, our credit report history, right? So if you are a renter and you have a decent credit score and you have a steady job that you can prove you've been there for at least two years or more, and if you can have a uh, money in your savings account that you don't touch. And a lot of people like to ask me, well, okay, so how much money should I have saved? Okay, so rule of thumb is whatever your monthly expenses are, counting everything, your rent, your utilities, your groceries, uh, fuel for your vehicle, maintenance for your vehicle, um, your car registration, car insurance, uh, renter's insurance, all of the bills you have in one month and you can have six months worth of those savings, that would be considered seasoned money that a lender would look upon very favorably and it's actually something that you should have. You should prepare uh, having these kinds of savings when you're considering home ownership. Home, uh, I find that a lot of people who get, who who are fortunate enough to find themselves in home ownership have not strategized, have not planned. They don't have a savings in case of an emergency. What if they do lose their job? You know, they are literally living paycheck to paycheck. So yes, for those listening to me today, if you find yourself renting and you have a steady job and you have a decent FICO score and you have savings, then, and you're considering home ownership, homeownership mortgage payment would be much less than your rent. And then we're, of course, if you're, if you're gonna be speaking, comparatively speaking, if you're renting in an area that you're thinking about purchasing a home in, then those, rent, those mortgages should be comparable to actually be less than those rents being paid in the same area. So if you're looking at purchasing versus renting and the, the costs of both, has everything to do with location, location, location. Rents are gonna be higher in nicer areas, right? Prices of homes are gonna be more expensive in nicer areas. Rents would be lower in not so desirable areas. Same thing with home pricing. Home pricing would not be as expensive in non-desirable areas. So those would be things to consider as far as rent, the price of rent, versus the price of a mortgage. So you, you, men you mentioned something about a 30-year plan. Uh, why does it take so long? 30-year <laughs> term. Okay, so there- Can you like uh, say you stumbled upon a lottery ticket <laughs> and you just happened to sure. rub it and you, yeah, you got some money. Yes. Can you pay that it, off right off, like a, rip it off like a band-aid? If, if you were fortunate enough to win the lottery, yeah. then yes, you can pay, pay for your dream home cash. In okay. other words, you don't have a more monthly mortgage payment. Yeah. The only thing you'd have to pay for is your property taxes and your insurance. Yeah. And you can even pay your insurance a year in advance if you wanted to. So uh -huh. you could literally do that. For those not as fortunate, <laughs> there are what they call a 30-year term, a 15-year term, or a 7-year term, or anything in between. What does that mean? That means that on an average, when you purchase a home, people choose a 30-year term because it's the most common. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the most advantageous, but it's the most common. And they don't even look at, well, okay, well, what does a 15 year term look like? Or, or even a 20 year term look like? So the less time that you have to pay your mortgage, the more expensive the mortgage is gonna be. This is why most people gear towards using or choosing and picking a 30 year term. The downfall of a 30 year term you are paying much more for your home because you have a longer amount of time to pay it, but you have a higher interest rate that you're paying into that, fixed into that mortgage. So the faster you can pay off the house, the less you're actually spending on it in terms of interest. At the end of a 30 year term paying an interest rate, you can, you're probably paying close to double, if not double, 
the price of your home at the end of the 30 year term. Okay. So what I'm saying is if your home costs $500,000 and you have an interest rate of let's say three, four, five percent, whatever the interest rate, of course, interest rate has a lot to do with it, but anything above a 5% and you have 30 years to pay it, you're literally paying at the end of it. When you're done paying for your home, you paid a million for it. Okay. So, so can you, can you uh, like modify or renegotiate, say you got a better job and you, you first you negotiated with, with a 30 year uh, term, but then, Hey, I'm making better money now. Can I you can. pay it in seven? You can, and again, that depends on your original contract. So you have to look at that possibility. Look at how the contract is, is formed. Mm -hmm. What does it say? And ask the question to the lender or the bank and say, okay, Mr. Banker, mm -hmm. uh, this, is what I, this is my down payment. This is what I can afford to pay every month. And this, this is my property tax payment. This is my insurance payment. Okay, um, could I refinance the terms how soon can i refinance you got you got to ask that question okay and the banker will say okay well uh you the soonest you can refinance is seven years that's the soonest you can refinance let's say they say that so that your response would be okay if i refinance in seven years and i can make a bigger down a, a bigger payment monthly mortgage payment when we refinance in seven years could I do that? Yeah. Would I? Would you allow me to do that, or would there be a penalty if I if I am making my payment, my house payment faster, you know, getting it paid faster? So these are questions you must ask, and you must read the contract. Uh, again, uh, your the person that's helping you, the 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 uh, the agent, the real estate agent, should also be looking at this document with you. Two pairs of eyes is always better than just one pair of eyes. And a real estate agent has more experience with this documentation. Okay, that's great. So just between the two of us, don't tell anyone else. <laughs> don't tell anyone else. Just shh. lots of people are leaving California, yes. right? They're going to Texas because of taxes. Yes. Texas because of taxes. <laughs> so what have you heard about you know, like the real estate world or... Property uh, <clears throat> prices going down. Is it better to wait and see if prices go down to get into a, you know, get into buying a property? Okay, so there was a lot of talk uh, back in December, November that uh, house pricing uh, prices of homes would dip down a little bit, especially with all the foreclosures that were happening. Because there were, what does that mean? That meant that there were there were more homes, more product than there was the demand for it, or people that could afford to buy. And well, all the people that would normally be able to afford to buy, they've lost their jobs. They've lost their businesses. So the people that would normally be out there to purchase homes are not there anymore. So that would mean that pricing of the homes, values of homes would dip. That is what was ex expected. This was a talk in December. Well, we haven't quite seen that. And here we are coming up, up on February. It's right. It's how, how many people have left though? Because I've seen it in the papers, like uh, people are leaving. It's a massive exodus. There, that's happening. That is very true. Yes. So maybe in June we'll see like oh, there's you know, like, well, uh, we're, a million dollar home now costs a hundred thousand. Yeah. We're thinking that uh, when Playboy the, Mansion. When the moratorium, <laughs> when the moratoriums end, we're going to see a lot more of an exodus happening because people are really going to get hit with the reality of. I'm losing my house. I'm going to lose my house today or tomorrow, or I'm out of my house is lost. I've lost it. They've literally okay. knocked on my door. In those situations, these people have not planned. They don't know what they're going to do. They're, they haven't been able to find a job so or get a job. Now. So this so is they, why this you, doesn't happen you to need them. to plan now. Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. if you're a home, if you're a homeowner and you have equity, don't let the bank take it all. You know, don't allow a black mark to Wake be up. in your FICO score. You know, that's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt you in the future to buy a house. Yeah. And at least that equity that's in your home, by selling your home now, being proactive and selling your home right now, helping you find a, a, buy, a buyer, now you can get that equity. You can take that equity with you and you can start all over somewhere else without that stress you had on you all this time. And yes, those people that are getting their equities back, that are selling their home, they're looking at Florida. They're looking at Arizona. They're looking at, yeah, Texas. 
They're even looking at Mexico. They're looking at Oregon. They're looking at anywhere that's cheaper than good old California. All right. Where would you go? I don't know. I haven't. I mean, I'm not going to say that I haven't thought about it. Yeah. I have thought about it. If I go anywhere, it's going to be where it's not going to be cold. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to go somewhere like. Nowhere north. I mean, I love Oregon. <laughs> I, my daughter lives in, up in Oregon, and I know I would love to be closer to her. If I decided I was going to do that to move up to in Oregon and be closer to her, I would definitely have to make sure I build a custom sauna in my home <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I would have to make sure that I could work from home when I wanted to. As a real estate agent, obviously I could. So uh, yes, I would definitely have to have a sauna built in my home if I was going to consider moving anywhere where it was cold up north. Sauna, jacuzzi? <laughs> a salt uh, jacuzzi. Salt jacuzzi? Not a, not a chlorine jacuzzi. But that's oh. another talk for another time. That's for uh, the nutrition segment. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Let's continue with... Uh, okay. One thing I don't get, and, and this is really, uh, has been bugging me since we started. Why is it that moratorium doesn't apply for private mortgages? Why? Because conventional loans uh, are not mandated. They're not forced. They're not... They can't be forced to because they're a private corporation they're a private company they're not backed by the government okay. so they're they're a free bird they can do do what they want to do it's the free their, market yes all right so that's uh that's again, the problem that's a problem with uh capitalism <laughs> again it's up to their generous hearts you it's know the their discretion of their, their discretion to not kick their mom out of their house <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly all right so, okay, let's continue with um, some of the uh, relief bills. Mm, what are the good things that we have seen from the Trump presidency and the Joe Biden presidency towards relief bills for tenant protections, tenant aids? We can talk about both of them. Well, we haven't seen too much in, in help for renters uh, even in the Trump administration. For renters, not we, that much. We have not seen that in Trump's administration. So that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Uh, it looks like, I mean, I've been looking at the proposals uh, or the, the so-called proposals from the new administration, the Biden administration, and they are including help for renters in terms of helping them with the back rents because there hasn't been anything extended from the Trump administration. Yeah. So there's all this back rent. That They've been out of work for Seven months now. They need help with the back rents. Um, nine months now. Cause, nine months, cause yeah. Mar uh, started in March. It started in March. Yeah, March, nine March 17th, 2020. Yeah, so we're, we're up to 10 months. Mm -hmm. So going up on a year in March of this year will be a year. So they have all of the, those months of back rent that they have not been able to afford to pay. So in the Biden administration, we can look forward to the consideration that the Biden administration will include uh, monies in to help renters for back rent and another another thing that they're going to also in, consider to include is helping them to pay their utilities now utilities have, uh, have been forced or mandated or whatever you want to call it not to turn off the water not to turn off the power not to turn off their gas if they can't pay their bills so this is another aid this is another uh uh, way that they are going to also help in extending money towards paying those back bills uh, of the utilities and the rent. That's the, the help that we can see coming down the pike for renters. So <clears throat> I think we've covered almost everything. Um, we want to talk a little bit about, you. we already mentioned equity. But maybe if you get a, 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 a good definition of what is, what is equity and how it can be used for reverse mortgage and what it, and who does that work for? Just so we can, because okay. um, we just briefly touched it, but mm -hmm. it's important for lots of elderly couples or uh, mm -hmm. elderly homeowners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that might be going through tough times also that might need some money to pay for food or whatever. 
and they have this property with some equity. Okay, so the best way that I'm going to answer equity is by giving you a real life scenario in which I'm currently going through right now with uh, homeowners that I'm helping. These homeowners, I found them, I just, you know, um, actually, I didn't find them. Uh, an associate at the office found them. Uh, but my associate doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> so she called me and asked me if I wouldn't mind, you know, helping this, this couple see if they need any help, you know, what's going on with them. Uh, so I called them several times until finally they did answer the phone and I explained who I was and I started asking questions. Questions I was asking was, first of all, I know that they're going to foreclosure and I know that they have some equity in their home. According to my information that I had access to, it looked as if though they may have $150,000, $175,000 worth of equity in their home despite they're going through foreclosure. And they have a foreclosure date coming up in February this next month. So the um, the gentleman, the the uh, husband, uh, told me that they are currently currently hired an attorney to help stop the foreclosure, and that this attorney had actually stopped their foreclosure in the past uh, because they ha he has been in hardship since 2017. So he doesn't fall under any aid for the moratorium because his hardship began before March 17, 2020. But in his situation, he still has equity, but he clearly has a hardship and he has been paying an attorney and it's a good attorney, I might add, that has been very successful in stopping, halting the foreclosure. So he, he has a kind heart. So <laughs> so, they, so he found a good attorney, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this attorney, we've spoken to the attorney, and uh, of course the homeowner has allowed permission for yeah. us to speak to the attorney. Turns out that um, he has a first and he has a second loan on the house. Okay. The first is $325,000, I believe, and the second is, I want to say, $85,000. The attorney is working to try to remove the second. In that case, if he's successful in removing the second, he, the homeowner, would have around $150,000, which is what I was seeing based on my paperwork. In equity? In, in equity. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that even though he owes a total of $475,000 of the house he still owes he has he he owns a portion of that house and that portion is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars if the lawyer can remove the second okay if the lawyer cannot remove the second then the homeowner will only have i believe like ninety thousand dollars worth of equity my so, he, so he should sell the house and go to Cancun. So my point is this. <laughs> he has equity. Yeah. Whether it's 90000 or $150,000. Yeah. So again, what does equity mean? Equity is kind of like stock. Yeah. You don't own all the company. Yeah. You only own a percentage or a portion of that company. All right. That's kind of what equity represents. You own a portion of your house. That means that amount of money you've paid down over the years every month that equity started going up because that's how much more money you've been putting down on the house. Now, another way you can earn equity, which is called unearned equity. Well, what does that mean? That means this. Let's say you've bought your house during a time when the market was just okay, was doing okay. And you've lived in your house for a total of five, you know, five years, let's say. And now the economy or the housing boomed. It went up in, in, in value that you, that you, the house you live in. Yeah. And you bought the house originally for $500,000. Well, now the house is worth $600,000. Okay. Okay. So, but you originally put $100,000 down payment on the house, yeah. which meant you had a $400,000 balance mortgage you were paying every month for yeah. 30 years. But out of the blue, God was gracious, shined upon you. The more, uh, home values went up and now your home is worth $600,000. So you've earned an additional $100,000 because it went up that much. So now you, the homeowner, you don't have just $100,000 worth of equity. You have $200,000 worth of equity. 
Okay, so you made a so you, you so made that, a profit. That's one of the, the that's one of the, the the blessings of being a homeowner. Of course, the the reverse is true. Meaning, what if the market takes a downturn, and now you're upside down? You your house is worth less less than what you paid for it when you first bought it. Okay, that's the risk you take becoming a homeowner. And the wise homeowner t is paying attention to the economy. So you kind of sh should kind of major in economy, be, uh, really pay attention to the market so you can know when's a good time to buy and be ready and be prepared. Have that seasoned money in case hard times do come. Guess what? You're all right. You got money. You can still withdraw from your savings to pay down that mortgage. And that's what's key for people who are wanting to be homeowners because it is a way of establishing wealth. It's one of the first ways most people establish wealth. And if you respect the rules of owning a home and you know how to manage your money and you're paying attention to the economy and you have savings and you pay that mortgage rain or shine until it's paid off, now you're a wise homeowner, you are a good steward of your money and foreclosure should never happen upon you. Okay. Well, that's something, uh, important to reflect upon. Uh, I want to thank L for giving us, giving us uh, this explanation, which is necessary in these times. Do you want to add anything before? Uh, if you're, a, a, uh, I like to help people uh, right now. I'm working with a young couple that is, uh, renting. They want to be a homeowner in the future. Uh, unfortunately, their FICO score isn't that high. And a uh, good thing, though, is they've been at their job for a very long time, more than two years. So it's just a matter of uh, working and, and guiding them and creating a strategy. And this is what I am doing, helping this young couple so that they can be homeowners in the very near future, despite what's going on with the pandemic, despite what's going on with everything else that we could still plan, we could still strategize. And I like to help young couples or, you know, anybody who would like to be a homeowner and doesn't know the first step, uh, doesn't know what to do or how to go about it. Let's talk. Call me. Okay. Thank you, Elle. Thank you everybody for listening and hope to see you soon. Goodbye.